Chapter 25 And this, said I, with my mind full of what I had witnessed, this, I presume, is your usual form of burial. Our invariable form, answered Aflan. What is it amongst your people? We inter the whole body within the earth. What? To degrade the form you have loved and honored, the wife on whose breast you have slept, to the loathsomeness of corruption. But if the soul lives again, can it matter whether the body waste within the earth, or is reduced by that awful mechanism, worked no doubt by the agency of Rill, into a pinch of dust? You answer well, said my host, and there is no arguing on a matter of feeling. But to me your custom is horrible and repulsive, and would serve to invest death with gloomy and hideous associations. It is something, too, to my mind, to be able to preserve the token of what has been our kinsman or friend within the abode in which we live. We thus feel more sensibly that he still lives, though not visibly so to us. But our sentiments in this, as in all things, are created by custom. Custom is not to be changed by a wise arm, any more than it is changed by a wise community, without the greatest deliberation, followed by the most earnest conviction. It is only thus that a change ceases to be changeability, and once made is made for good. When we regained the house, Aflin summoned some of the children in his service and sent them to round up several of his friends, requesting their attendance that day, during the easy hours, to a festival in honor of his kinsman's recall to the all-good. This was the largest and gayest assembly I ever witnessed during my stay among the Arna, and was prolonged far into the silent hours. The banquet was spread in a vast chamber, reserved especially for grand occasions. This differed from our entertainments, and was not without a certain resemblance to those we read of in the luxurious age of the Roman Empire. There was not one great table set out, but numerous small ones, each appropriated to eight guests. It is considered that beyond that number, conversation languishes and friendship cools. The Arna never laugh loud, as I before observed, but the cheerful ring of their voices at the various tables betokened gaiety of intercourse. As they have no stimulant drinks, and are temperate in food, though so choice and dainty, the banquet itself did not last long. The tables sank through the floor, and then came musical entertainments for those who liked them. Many, however, wandered away. Some of the younger ascended in their wings, for the hall was roofless, forming aerial dances. Others strolled through the various apartments, examining the curiosities with which they were stored, or formed themselves into groups for various games, the favorite of which is a complicated kind of chess, played by eight persons. I mixed with the crowd, but was prevented joining in the conversation by the constant companionship of one or the other of my host's sons, appointed to keep me from obtrusive questionings. The guests, however, noticed me but slightly. They had grown accustomed to my appearance, seeing me so often in the streets, and I had ceased to excite much curiosity. To my great delight, Z avoided me and evidently sought to excite my jealousy by marked attentions to a very handsome young Arn, who, though, as is the modest custom of the males when addressed by females, he answered with downcast eyes and blushing cheeks, and was demure and shy, as young ladies new to the world are in most civilized countries, except England and America, was evidently much charmed by the tall Guy, and ready to falter a bashful yes if she had actually proposed. Fervently hoping that she would, and more and more averse to the idea of reduction to a cinder after I had seen the rapidity with which a human body can be hurried into a pinch of dust, I amused myself by watching the manners of the other young people. 
I had the satisfaction of observing that Z was no singular asserter of a female's most valued rights. Wherever I turned my eyes or lent my ears, it seemed to me that a Guy was the wooing party and the Arne the coy and reluctant one. The pretty innocent airs which an Arne gave himself on being thus courted, the dexterity with which he evaded direct answers to professions of attachment, or turned into jest the flattering compliments addressed to him, would have done honor to the most accomplished coquette. Both my male chaperones were subjected greatly to these seductive influences, and both acquitted themselves with wonderful honor to their tact and self-control. I said to the elder son, who preferred mechanical employments to the management of a great property, and who was of an eminently philosophical temperament, I find it difficult to conceive how, at your age, and with all the intoxicating effects on the senses of music and lights and perfumes, you could be so cold to that impassioned young Guy who has just left you with tears in her eyes at your cruelty. The young Arne replied with a sigh, Gentle Tish, the greatest misfortune in life is to marry one Guy if you are in love with another. Oh, you're in love with another? Alas, yes. And she does not return your love. I don't know. Sometimes a look, a tone, makes me hope so. But she has never plainly told me that she loves me. Have you not whispered in her own ear that you love her? Fee, what are you thinking of? What world do you come from? Could I betray the dignity of my sex? Could I be so unarnly, so lost to shame, as to own love to a gi who has not first owned hers to me? Pardon? I was not quite aware that you had pushed the modesty of your sex so far. But does no arn ever say to a gi, I love you, till she says it first to him? I can't say that no arn has ever done so, but if he ever does... He is disgraced in the eyes of the Arna, and secretly despised by the G.E. No Guy, well brought up, would listen to him. She would consider that he audaciously infringed on the rights of her sex, while outraging the modesty which dignifies his own. It is very provoking, continued the Arn, for she whom I love has certainly courted no one else, and I cannot but think she likes me. Sometimes I suspect that she does not court me because she fears I would ask some unreasonable settlement as to the surrender of her rights. But if so, she cannot really love me. For where a Guy really loves, she forgoes all rights. Is this young Guy present? Oh, yes. She sits yonder, talking to my mother. I looked in the direction to which my eyes were thus guided, and saw a Guy dressed in robes of bright red, which, among this people, is a sign that a Guy as yet prefers a single state. She wears grey, a neutral tint, to indicate that she is looking about for a spouse. Dark purple, if she wishes to intimate that she has made a choice. Purple and orange, when she is betrothed or married. Light blue, when she is divorced or a widow, and would marry again. Light blue is, of course, seldom seen. Among a people where all are of so high a type of beauty, it is difficult to single out one as peculiarly handsome. My young friend's choice seemed to me to possess the average of good looks, but there was an expression in her face that pleased me more than did the faces of the young G.E. generally, because it looked less bold, less conscious of female rights. I observed that, while she talked to Bra, she glanced from time to time, sidelong at my young friend. Courage, said I, that young Guy loves you. Aye, but if she shall not say so, how am I the better for her love? Your mother is aware of your attachment. Perhaps so. I never owned it to her. It would be unarnly to confide such a weakness to a mother. I have told my father. He may have told it again to his wife. Will you permit me to quit you for a moment and glide behind your mother and your beloved? I am sure they are talking about you. 
Do not hesitate. I promise that I will not allow myself to be questioned till I rejoin you. The young Arne pressed his hand on his heart, touched me lightly on the head, and allowed me to quit his side. I stole unobserved behind his mother and his beloved. I overheard their talk. Bra was speaking. She said, There can be no doubt of this. Either my son, who is of marriageable age, will be decoyed into marriage with one of his many suitors, or he will join those who emigrate to a distance, and we shall see him no more. If you really care for him, my dear Lo, you should propose. I do care for him, Bra, but I doubt if I could ever really win his affections. He is fond of his inventions and timepieces, and I am not like Z, but so dull that I fear I could not enter into his favorite pursuits, and then he would get tired of me, and at the end of three years divorce me, and I could never marry another, never. It is not necessary to know about timepieces to know how to be so necessary to the happiness of an Arne who cares for his timepieces that he would rather give up the timepieces than divorce his gi. You see, my dear Lo, continued Bra, that precisely because we are the stronger sex, we rule the other provided we never show our strength. If you were superior to my son in making timepieces and automata, you should, as his wife, Always let him suppose you thought him superior in that art to yourself. The Arn tacitly allows the preeminence of the Gi in all except his own special pursuit. But if she either excels him in that, or affects not to admire him for his proficiency in it, he will not love her very long. Perhaps he may even divorce her. But where a Gi really loves, she soon learns to love all that an Arn does." The young Gi made no answer to this address. She looked down musingly. Then a smile crept over her lips, and she rose, still silent, and went through the crowd, till she paused by the young Arn who loved her. I followed her steps, but discreetly stood at a little distance while I watched them. Somewhat to my surprise, till I recollected the coy tactics among the Arna, the lover seemed to receive her advances with an air of indifference. He even moved away, but she pursued his steps, and, a little time after, both spread their wings and vanished amid the luminous space above. Just then I was accosted by the chief magistrate, who mingled with the crowd, distinguished by no signs of deference or homage. It so happened that I had not seen this great dignitary since the day I had entered his dominions, and recalling Aflin's words as to his terrible doubt whether or not I should be dissected, a shudder crept over me at the sight of his tranquil countenance. "'I hear much of you, stranger, from my son Tari,' said the Tur, laying his hands politely on my bended head. "'He is very fond of your society.' and I trust you are not displeased with the customs of our people. I muttered some unintelligible answer, which I intended to be an assurance of my gratitude for the kindness I had received from the Tur, and my admiration of his countrymen, but the dissecting knife gleamed before my mind's eye and choked my utterance. A softer voice said, My brother's friend must be dear to me. And looking up, I saw a young Gi, who might be sixteen years old, standing beside the magistrate and gazing at me with a very benignant countenance. She had not come to her full growth and was scarcely taller than myself, namely about five feet ten inches. And, thanks to that comparatively diminutive stature, I thought her the loveliest Gi I had hitherto seen. I suppose something in my eyes revealed that impression, for her countenance, grew yet more benignant. Therese tells me, she said, that you have not yet learned to accustom yourself to wings. That grieves me, for I should have liked to fly with you. Alas, I replied, I can never hope to enjoy that happiness. I am assured by Z that the safe use of wings is a hereditary gift and it would take generations before one of my race could poise himself in the air like a bird. Let not that thought vex you too much, replied this amiable princess, for, after all, there must come a day when Z and myself must resign our wings for ever. 
Perhaps when that day comes, we might be glad if the arn we choose was also without wings. The tur had left us and was lost amongst the crowd. I began to feel at ease with Tari's charming sister, and rather startled by the boldness of my compliment in replying that no arn she could choose would ever use his wings to fly away from her. It is so against custom for an arn to say such civil things to a gi till she has declared her passion for him, and been accepted as his betrothed, that the young maiden stood quite dumbfounded for a few moments. Nevertheless, she did not seem displeased. At last, recovering herself, she invited me to accompany her into one of the less crowded rooms, and to listen to the songs of the birds. I followed her steps as she glided before me, and she led me into a chamber almost deserted. A fountain of naphtha was playing in the center of the room. Round it were ranged soft divans, and the walls of the room were open on one side to an aviary in which the birds were chanting their artful chorus. The gi seated herself on one of the divans, and I placed myself at her side. Tari tells me, she said, that Halflin has made it the law of his house, that you are not to be questioned as to the country you come from, or the reason why you visit us. Is it so? It is. May I, at least, without sinning against that law, ask at least if the G.E. in your country are of the same pale color as yourself, and no taller? I do not think, O oh beautiful Guy, that I infringe the law of Aflin, which is more binding on myself than on any one, if I answer questions so innocent. The G.E. in my country are much fairer of hue than I am, and their average height is at least a head shorter than mine. They cannot then be so strong as the Arna amongst you, but I suppose their superior vril force makes up for such extraordinary disadvantage of size. They do not profess the vril force as you know it, but still they are very powerful in my country, and an Arn has small chance of a happy life if he be not more or less governed by his gi. You speak feelingly, said Therese's sister, in a tone of voice half sad, half petulant. You are married, of course. No, certainly not. Nor betrothed? Nor betrothed. Is it possible that no gi has proposed to you? In my country, the gi does not propose. The arn speaks first. What a strange reversal of the laws of nature, said the maiden. And what want of modesty in your sex! But have you never proposed, never loved one gi more than another? I felt embarrassed by these ingenious questionings, and said, Pardon me, but I think we are beginning to infringe upon Aflin's injunction. This much only will I answer, and then, I implore you, ask no more. I did once feel the preference you speak of. I did propose, and the gi would willingly have accepted me but her parents refused their consent. Parents? Do you mean seriously to tell me that parents can interfere with the choice of their daughters? Indeed they can, and do very often. I should not like to live in that country, said the Guy simply, but I hope you will never go back to it. I bowed my head in silence. The Guy gently raised my face with her right hand, and looked into it tenderly. Stay with us, she said. Stay with us and be loved. What I might have answered, what dangers of becoming a cinder I might have encountered, I still troubled to think, when the light of the naphtha fountain was obscured by the shadow of wings, and Z, flying through the open roof, alighted beside us. She said not a word, but, taking my arm with her mighty hand, she drew me away, as a mother draws a naughty child, and led me through the apartments to one of the corridors, on which, by the mechanism they generally they generally prefer two stairs, we ascended to my own room. This gained, Z breathed on my forehead, and touched my breast with her staff, and I was instantly plunged into a profound sleep. 
when I awoke some hours later and heard the songs of the birds in the adjoining aviary, the remembrance of Therese's sister, her gentle looks and caressing words, vividly returned to me. And so impossible is it for one born and reared in our upper world's state of society to divest himself of ideas dictated by vanity and ambition, that I found myself instinctively building proud castles in the air. Tish though I be, thus ran my meditations. Tish though I be, it is then clear that Z is not the only Guy whom my appearance can captivate. Evidently, I am loved by a princess, the first maiden of this land, the daughter of the absolute monarch, whose autocracy they so idly seek to disguise by the republican title of chief magistrate. But for the sudden swoop of that horrible Z, this royal lady would have formally proposed to me, and though it may be very well for Aflen, who is only a subordinate minister, a mere commissioner of light, to threaten me with destruction if I accept his daughter's hand, yet a sovereign whose word is a law could compel the community to abrogate any custom that forbids intermarriage with one of a strange race and which in itself is a contradiction to their boasted equality of ranks it is not to be supposed that this daughter who spoke with such incredulous scorn of the interference of parents would not have sufficient influence with her royal father to save me from the combustion to which Athlyn would condemn my form. And if I were exalted by such an alliance, who knows but what the monarch might elect me as his successor? Why not? Few among this indolent race of philosophers like the burden of such greatness. All might be pleased to see the supreme power lodged in the hands of an accomplished stranger who has experience of other and livelier forms of existence. And once chosen, what reforms I would institute, what additions to the really pleasant but too monotonous life of this realm my familiarity with the civilized nations above ground would affect. I am fond of the sports of the field. Next to war is not the chase a king's pastime. In what varieties of strange game does this netherworld abound? How interesting to strike down creatures that were known above ground before the deluge! But how, by that terrible vril, in which form, from want of hereditary transmission, I could never be proficient? No, but by a civilized, handy breech-loader, which these ingenious mechanicians could not only make, but no doubt improve. Nay, surely I saw one in the museum. Indeed, as absolute king, I should discountenance Vril altogether, except in cases of war. Apropos of war, it is perfectly absurd to stint a people so intelligent, so rich, so well armed, to a petty limit of territory sufficing for ten thousand or twelve thousand families. Is not this restriction a mere philosophical crotchet, at variance with the aspiring element in human nature, such as has been partially, and with complete failure, tried in the upper world by the late Mr. Robert Owen. Of course, one would not go to war with the neighboring nations as well armed as one's own subjects. But then, what of those regions inhabited by races unacquainted with Vril, and apparently resembling, in their democratic institutions, my American countrymen? One might invade them without offense to the Vril nations, our allies, appropriate their territories, extending, perhaps, to the most distant regions of the nether earth, and thus rule over an empire in which the sun never sets. I forgot in my enthusiasm that over those regions there was no sun to set. As for the fantastical notion against conceding fame or renown to an eminent individual, because, forsooth, bestowal of honors ensures contest in the pursuit of them, stimulates angry passions, and mars the felicity of peace. It is opposed to the very elements, not only of the human, but of the brute creation, which are all, if tameable, participators in the sentiment of praise and emulation. What renown would be given to a king who thus extended his empire? I should be deemed a demigod. Thinking of that, the other fanatical notion of regulating this life by reference to one which, no doubt, we Christians firmly believe in, 
but never take into consideration, I resolved that enlightened philosophy compelled me to abolish a heathen religion so superstitiously at variance with modern thought and practical action. Musing over these various projects, I felt how much I should have liked at that moment to brighten my wits by a good glass of whiskey and water. Not that I am habitually a spirit drinker, but certainly there are times when a little stimulant of alcoholic nature, taken with a cigar, enlivens the imagination. Yes, certainly among these herbs and fruits, there would be a liquid from which one could extract a pleasant vinous alcohol, and, with a stake, cut off one of those elks. Ah, what an offense to science to reject the animal food which our first medical men agree in recommending to the gastric juices of mankind. One would certainly pass a more exhilarating hour of repast. Then, too, instead of those antiquated dramas performed by childish amateurs, certainly, when I am king, I will introduce our modern opera and a corps de ballet, for which one might find, among the nations I shall conquer, young females of less formidable height and thews than the G.E., not armed with rill, and not insisting upon one's marrying them. I was so completely wrapped in these and similar reforms, political, social, and moral, calculated to bestow on the people of the nether world the blessings of a civilization known to the races of the upper, that I did not perceive that a Z had entered the chamber, till I heard a deep sigh, and, raising my eyes, beheld her standing by my couch. I need not say that, according to the manners of this people, a Guy can, without indecorum, visit an Arne in his chamber, although an Arne would be considered forward and immodest to the last degree if he entered the chamber of a Guy without previously obtaining her permission to do so. Fortunately, I was in the full habiliments I had worn when Z had deposited me on the couch. Nevertheless, I felt much irritated, as well as shocked, by her visit, and asked in a rude tone what she wanted. "'Speak gently, beloved one, I entreat you,' she said, "'for I am very unhappy. I have not slept since we parted.' "'A due sense of shameful conduct to me, as your father's guest,' might well suffice to banish sleep from your eyelids. Where was the affection you pretended to have for me? Where was even that politeness on which the Vrilya pride themselves, when, taking advantage alike of that physical strength in which your sex, in this extraordinary region, excels our own, and of those detestable and unhallowed powers which the agencies of Vril invest in your eyes and finger ends, you exposed me to humiliation before your assembled visitors, before Her Royal Highness, I mean, the daughter of your own chief magistrate, carrying me off to bed like a naughty infant, and plunging me into sleep without asking my consent. Ungrateful, do you reproach me for the evidences of my love? Can you think that, even if unstung by the jealousy which attends upon love till it fades away in blissful trust, when we know that the heart we have woed is won, I could be indifferent to the perils to which the audacious overtures of that silly little child might expose you. Hold! Since you introduce the subject of perils, it perhaps does not misbecome me to say that my most imminent perils come from yourself, or at least would come if I believed in your love and accepted your addresses. Your father has told me plainly that in that case I should be consumed into a cinder with as little compunction as if I were the reptile whom Tari blasted into ashes with the flash of his wand. Do not let that fear chill your heart to me, exclaimed Z, dropping on her knees and absorbing my right hand in the space of her ample palm. It is true, indeed, that we two cannot wed as those of the same race wed. True, that the love between us must be pure as that which, in our belief, exists between lovers who reunite in the new life beyond that boundary at which the old life ends. But is it not happiness enough to be together, wedded in mind and in heart? Listen, I have just left my father. He consents to our union on those terms. 
I have sufficient influence with the College of Sages to ensure their request to the Tur not to interfere with the free choice of a Gi, provided that her wedding with one of another race be but the wedding of souls. Oh, think you that true love needs ignoble union. It is not that I yearn only to be by your side in this life, to be part and parcel of your joys and sorrows here. I ask for a tie which will bind us for ever and for ever in the world of immortals. Do you reject me? As she spoke, she knelt, and the whole character of her face was changed. Nothing of sternness left to its grandeur, a divine light as that of an immortal shining out from its human beauty but she rather awed me as an angel than moved me as a woman, and, after an embarrassed pause, I faltered forth evasive expressions of gratitude, and sought as delicately as I could to point out how humiliating would be my position amongst her race in the light of a husband who might never be permitted the name of father. But, said Z, this community does not constitute the whole world. No, nor do all the populations comprised in the League of the Vrilya. For thy sake, I will renounce my country and my people. We will fly together to some region where thou shalt be safe. I am strong enough to bear thee on my wings across the deserts that intervene. I am skilled enough to cleave open amidst the rocks, valleys in which to build our home. Solitude and a hut with thee would be to me society and the universe. Or wouldst thou return to thine own world, above the surface of this, exposed to the uncertain seasons, and lit by the changeful orbs which constitute by thy description the fickle character of those savage regions? If so, speak the word, and I will force the way for thy return, so that I am thy companion there, though there as here, but a partner of thy soul, a fellow traveler with thee to the world in which there is no parting and no death. I could not but be deeply affected by the tenderness, at once so pure and so impassioned, with which these words were uttered, and in a voice that would have rendered musical the roughest sounds in the rudest tongue. And for a moment it did occur to me that I might avail myself of Z's agency to effect a safe and speedy return to the upper world. But a very brief space for reflection sufficed to show me how dishonorable and base a return for such devotion it would be to allure thus away from her own people and a home in which I had been so hospitably treated, a creature to whom our world would be so abhorrent, and for whose barren, if spiritual love, I could not reconcile myself to renounce the more human affection of mates less exalted above my erring self. With this sentiment of duty towards the Gi, combined another of duty towards the whole race I belong to, could I venture to introduce into the upper world a being so formidably gifted, a being that, with a movement of her staff, could in less than an hour reduce New York and its glorious kumpash into a pinch of snuff? rob her of her staff. With her science, she could easily construct another, and with the deadly lightnings that armed the slender engine, her whole frame was charged. If thus dangerous to the cities and populations of the whole upper earth, could she be a safe companion to myself, in case her affection should be subjected to change or embittered by jealousy? These thoughts, which it takes so many words to express, passed rapidly through my brain and decided my answer. Z, I said in the softest tones I could command, and pressing respectful lips on the hand into whose clasp mine vanished. Z, I can find no words to say how deeply I am touched, and how highly I am honored by a love so disinterested and self-immolating. My best return to it is perfect frankness. Each nation has its customs. The customs of yours do not allow you to wed me. The customs of mine are equally opposed to such a union between those of races so widely differing. On the other hand, though not deficient in courage among my own people, 
or amid dangers with which I am familiar, I cannot, without a shudder of horror, think of constructing a bridal home in the heart of some dismal chaos, with all the elements of nature, fire and water, and mephitic gases, at war with each other, and with the probability that, at some moment, while you are busied in cleaving rocks, or conveying vril into lamps, I should be devoured by a crack, which your operations disturbed from its hiding place. I, a mere tish, do not deserve the love of a gi, so brilliant, so learned, so potent as yourself. Yes, I do not deserve that love, for I cannot return it. Z released my hand, rose to her feet, and turned her face away to hide her emotions. Then she glided noiselessly along the room, and paused at the threshold. Suddenly, impelled as by a new thought, she returned to my side, and said in a whispered tone, You told me you would speak with perfect frankness. With perfect frankness, then, answer me this question. If you cannot love me, do you love another? Certainly I do not. You do not love Therese's sister? I never saw her before last night. That is no answer. Love is swifter than frill. You hesitate to tell me. Do not think it is only jealousy that prompts me to caution you. If the Tur's daughter should declare love to you, if, in her ignorance, she confides to her father any preference that may justify his belief that she will woo you, he will have no option but to request your immediate destruction, as he is specially charged with the duty of consulting the good of the community, which could not allow the daughter of the Rilya to wed a son of the Tisha, in that sense of marriage which does not confine itself to union of the souls. Alas, there would then be for you no escape. She has no strength of wing to uphold you through the air. She has no science wherewith to make a home in the wilderness. Believe that here my friendship speaks, and that my jealousy is silent. With these words, Z left me, and recalling those words, I thought no more of succeeding to the throne of the Vrilya, or of the political, social, or moral reforms I should institute in the capacity of absolute sovereign.